Take a look at this question. Let A and B be non-empty sets where A is a subset of B. Prove that A is a subset of A intersection B. If it's been a while since you looked at sets, this might not be clear to you right away. So let's think about it for a second. A is a subset of B means A is contained in B. A is a part of B. A intersection B is the set of things in both A and B. So if A is contained in B, then all the things in A are in B. So A should also be contained in the set of things in both A and B, right? Does that make sense? You might know this is true, but if you were to write out an explanation like this, or draw a picture with it, you probably wouldn't get any marks on an assignment, and you probably shouldn't. So how do you prove this? You'll find that a lot of university mathematics textbooks begin with an introduction to set theory. And to someone who has come from a standard secondary school education, this can seem really pointless. Sets are like one of the first things we learn about in school, and if statements like this aren't clear right away, they definitely are once you have a think about it. It seems kind of simple, you want to get to the real math. But then you're asked to prove these questions. So how do you do that? Well, you might try to give an explanation or, or a little drawing. But it's not really clear what a proof means. What is enough? It can get kind of frustrating. This little disconnect, this frustration, I think represents a huge transition in the way we think about maths. And I think it deserves more attention than it gets. If you're at this stage in your maths career, hopefully I can help. Take a look at these two textbooks. One of these is an undergrad level probability theory textbook I found online, and the other one is one of my old secondary school maths textbooks. There's this very clear and very boring structure to the university textbook. Definition, lemma, proof, example, theorem, proof, example, and so on. The secondary school textbook, on the other hand, has colour. It has illustrations and explanations. These two books, beyond being technically about teaching maths, are really trying to do something very different. The secondary school textbook is trying to teach you maths in a way that you'll remember it, and be able to use it, and that way you can go into the world and start doing some calculations or analyze some data. The university textbook, well, that's not really the goal. If it is, they're doing a pretty bad job at it. So what is the goal? Let's look at this question again. Let A and B be non-empty sets where A is a subset of B. Prove that A is a subset of A intersection B. How exactly would you use this in the real world? You've got a group of things and then a group contained in that group. Maybe we can think of B as the set of all children in a classroom, and A is the set of all boys in a classroom. So A is contained in B because all the boys are children. The statement we are being asked to prove is that the group of all the boys in the classroom is contained in the group of all the children in the classroom who are also boys. That's so useless. It's just needlessly complicating something obvious. Maybe there's a reason why questions like this don't show up in secondary school textbooks. So why do they show up so often in university ones? But is it even obvious, or is it wrong? We've been saying that subset means slice, or contained in. If A is a subset of B, then A is a part of B. But A and A intersection B are kind of the same thing. The group of all the boys in the classroom isn't just a part of the group of all the children in the classroom who are also boys, it is the group of all the children in the classroom who are also boys. So if A is equal to A intersection B, is it, can it be also a subset of it? What does subset even really mean? If you've studied set theory, or something set theory adjacent recently, you've probably got a good idea. But if you haven't dealt with sets in a while, or ever, maybe you've just got this feeling or intuition of what a subset is. And that can't be enough, right? If we're trying to figure out what it means to prove something, it's got to involve having some sort of clear technical definitions for what exactly it is we're trying to prove. So if you're a student, look for some in your notes, otherwise we should write some. So here's a definition for a subset. A is a subset of B, means if X is in A, then X is in B. This is another way of saying everything in A is in B. It's a loose, inclusive definition of a subset. It means A is a part of or equal to B. So it works for our theorem. Next, we should define what an intersection is. The intersection of A and B is the set of all things in A and in B. So it's the set of all things, we could say the set of all X's, with the property that they are in both A and B. That's all. 
This is the conventional way to write that, and it reads a intersection b is the set of all x such that, or with the property that, x is in a and x is in b. So let's see if we can come up with a better proof for this, given what we know. So a is a subset of b means that if x is in a, then x is in b. And a intersection b is the set of all x such that x is in a and x is in b. OK, so how do we prove this? Well, we can start by thinking about some property we can assign to any general element in A. So just like we started this question, or this question was started with let A and B be non-empty sets, let's start with let's, or let X be in A. OK, what can we say from here? Well, we know that A is a subset of B. And because A is a subset of B, that means that if X is in A, then X is in B. So we can say that X is in B, by our definition. OK, what can we say now? Let X be in A, X is in B. So we know that X is in A, and it's in B. So we can write that down as our next line. X is in A and X is in B. OK, so if X is in A and X is in B, then X fulfills the property of A intersection B. So we can say from there that X is in A intersection B. And then we started off with let X be in A, and we were able to say that X is in A intersection B. So from this, we can say that anything that's in A has the property that it's also in A intersection B, which is the definition of a subset. So A is a subset of A intersection B. So every single step here has a, uh, has a clear logical reason. And this is the kind of proof that a lecturer would probably accept. See these symbols here? You might have seen them before. I just threw them in there without mentioning. But they mean something. This is an implication symbol. It's what's known as a logical connective. This proof feels very strong, because every step we take feels like an obvious logical consequence. And it is a logical consequence. And we can get deeper into and study the logic. This symbol, implication, means that if the previous expression is true, the next expression will be true. So if P implies Q, that means whenever P is true, Q is true. That's its definition. And a property of this connective, when we can and hopefully will someday formally prove, is that if the first expression implies the second, and that one implies the third, and that one implies the fourth, and so on, then we have a chain of implications, and the first one implies the last one. So if you have P implies Q, and Q implies R, then that means that P implies R. That's called transitivity. So each implication we made followed from our definitions, and due to transitivity, we can say that X is in A implies that X is in A intersection B, which is just another way of writing our definition for A is a subset of A intersection B. Except, well, one of these expressions didn't technically follow from our definitions, this AND one. And AND is actually also a logical connective. It connects two expressions to create an expression that is true only when the other two expressions are true. We can prove these connectives and their properties more formally without words, and we will, hopefully. Learning mathematical logic is the foundation of proofs. There are more ways of proving things than through chains of implications. There are more connectives out there, and some unforeseen properties of it all. But alas, a video this entertaining can only go on so long. So let's answer the questions we began this video with. What does it mean to prove something? And what exactly are university textbooks trying to accomplish? Hopefully you have a pretty good understanding of the answer to the first question at this point. 
What it means to prove something is to show that thing logically follows from definitions and axioms that you can clarify before the proof. A proof is like a logical structure, built out of rules you've made or clarified. And I know there were some rules that we didn't clarify fully before the proof, but we'll get to them. And this structure, it's kind of like that of university textbooks, right? But on a grander scale. They begin with definitions and axioms, and then show that some theorems logically follow from them, and then they introduce more definitions and show how more theorems logically follow, and then so on until they've started opening up entire genres of maths. Their proofs are usually a little bit less rigorous than ours, but all their extra details are usually just assumed, left out so that they don't become tedious and take up too much space. The reason why university maths textbooks often start off with set theory isn't because set theory is useful outside of maths, it's because set theory is useful within maths. It's useful, necessary even, for proofs. It's like the base of a large tree of logical structures that university maths textbooks become, with its roots in mathematical logic stretching all the way up to everything and anything. Calculus, group theory, probability theory, topology, and it's not just textbooks that are structured in this way, it's everything. Here are some maths papers I found online. The exact same structure. Definitions, axioms, theorems. Building these logical structures, it kind of is maths. It's a language you've got to become literate in. Frustrating, but ultimately satisfying to learn. And isn't there something nice about sort of knowing that this thing we tried to prove is true? That your definitions and axioms necessarily and clearly lead to that theorem being true, with none of you or anyone else's thoughts about language and concepts being at all relevant? It's like this complex that exists on its own. We've just shown in our own way that it exists. So that's the difference. Secondary school textbook writers, and most other people, look at this great logical sequoia that is mathematics and pick off parts at the end of the branches. They learn how to use it. But to do this, they've got to have mathematicians and logicians learning how to illuminate those branches through their own colors and starting from the roots and the trunk. <laughs>